Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of The Botany Bistro. Coming at you live from Cincinnati, Ohio. We're hosted at the Civic Garden Center, which is in Avondale. And we would welcome you to come and visit us anytime if you're in the Cincinnati area. The Civic Garden Center has been here since 1942 and it's different every day. So we're really looking forward to a beautiful fall. Thankfully, we got some rain this past weekend, so hopefully we'll hold on to some of that fall color a little bit longer than we would have without it. And it's just a great time to be in the garden. My name is Mary Dudley, and I'm the Ecology Education Manager here at the Civic Garden Center. I'm a botanist who's passionate about plants and sharing knowledge with all of those who are interested, no matter what age or ability level they may be. I designed the Botany Bistro so that people could come together and have bite-sized botany lessons that apply to real-world scenarios that we experience as we garden and we farm. And so I'm really happy to launch into our topic today, which is plant physiology. So if you haven't joined us before, this is actually episode number nine. Um, and we have studied recently plant systematics and taxonomy. We've discussed plant anatomy, morphology, and we had some basic botany lessons as well. But today we're getting into some of the pretty intricate um, chemical processes that plants do inside their cells. So it's things that we haven't been able to really research deeply, um, except for the most recent history. And so it's really neat to find out more about these processes in plants. So today's menu is plant physiology. What's for lunch? Let's find out. So I have a lot of salads on this class <laughs> um, because I love talking about plants and it's a great time of year to really get out in the garden and harvest what those last little bits of produce that we're getting towards the end of this season um, but we're really lucky in the Cincinnati area to be able to do a three season harvest. And so right now, a lot of our gardeners are taking out their squash vines and some of their tomato plants that have stopped producing. And they're starting to plant things like kale and cabbage and spinach, lettuce. These are things that can grow in cooler temperatures and they actually thrive with a little bit of um, cool weather temps and then they'll be able to store more sugars, which makes them nice and sweet. So eating a little bit of fresh spinach after a evening of frost is just so delightful. So even though some of our gardens are starting to go to bed, there are other parts of our gardens that might be uh, you know, bursting with new produce over the coming weeks. So we've got some wonderful um, peppers in here. We've got some carrots even some fresh fall strawberries. We have a second harvest coming on of our strawberries. Some lettuce, some radishes, lots of our root crops are coming on right now. Um, and this is a celebration of photo autotrophs. So that's kind of our first word of the day is a photo autotroph. So we're gonna talk more about autotrophs as we discuss our different physiology processes. So uh, every time we have a little session, we talk about um, some plant concepts. We have a little bit of a taste of something for lunch. I hope you're all enjoying your lunches as well. And um, we look ahead to our next session, which will be October 20th, um, which will be part two of plant physiology. And you always have a little bit of homework. Uh, so your homework this week is to share with us your favorite photo autotroph and share that on our social media pages. Let's dig in. What is plant physiology? So like I said, it's these chemical processes that are happening within plant cells. Um, and it is linked to anatomy and morphology, ecology, environmental factors that um, plants deal with in order to grow and thrive. And so it includes focusing on processes such as photosynthesis, respiration, transpiration, seed germination, uh, tropisms, which we have gone over in other sessions about you know, how plants kind of follow the sun um, or maybe react to uh, physical touch or um, wind, things like that. 
And so these different processes are very important and very vital to plant functioning, uh, but it really has been in the recent history that we're able to even explore them because of the advancements in science and the different tools that we can use. Um, so we're going to dig into photosynthesis today. And this is uh, funny to me just because I have two young children um, who occasionally still are growing their big kid teeth. And if you know a small person in your life that is that are, you know, have a couple of teeth missing, having them say photosynthesis is one of the funniest things um, that we've done at home just randomly. So uh, you don't need fancy music or a uh, strobe light to get a good giggle out of that. Um, so photosynthesis is a good word to have in your pocket. The study of photosynthesis really started um, around the late 1700s, um, a little bit in the 1600s. We didn't get these terms that we're using today until later, but there was a scientist named Joseph Priestley who was burning a candle in a closed environment and that candle would go out. Um, it's like, okay, why isn't the candle continuing to burn? And so the scientist was playing around with different options of, you know, what's in the air. We really didn't understand what was in the air around us. And so thinking about how to keep this candle burning or how to sustain a longer uh, combustion session for the candle, the scientist tried lots of different things. One of the things that he tried was to add a plant into the chamber where the candle was and found that the addition of this plant, uh, not too close to the flame, <laughs> was able to sustain combustion for a longer period of time or renew combustion um, as it was added to a chamber that previously had not been able to support a flame. And so it started to just turn those wheels of what is happening? How can the presence of a plant allow for the candle to stay lit? Um, so now we know that that is because when plants are going through photosynthesis, they are producing oxygen, which is needed for uh, flames to continue to do their dancing. Um, but it was really early on uh, in that work of just people kind of thinking about different observations that they were making and going forward with the microscopy lessons that they had been developing and the different tools that they had seen so that they could actually understand how the atmosphere is changing because of the processes of plants. Um, later on, people started learning more about how roots were functioning and how water was moving around plants, how um, different chemical compounds were being taken up by plants. It was also very uh, interesting for scientists to think what are plants made out of because I don't have to put in an equivalent amount of soil for a plant to grow if we had to um, grow trees in pots as big as their mass that would be quite unwieldy um, and so they're like what are these plants using to take um, to, to put into their cells how are they getting this big and so when we think about this process uh, we think about how carbon-based life forms are all around us, right? So we know that we are carbon-based life forms, plants are carbon-based life forms. How does that really happen? Well, carbon dioxide is in the air. And uh, as plants absorb some of that carbon dioxide and internalize that into their cell structures, then those photoautotrophs um, are eaten by other species such as us. Um, and so we internalize some of that carbon as well. So just those little building blocks, people starting to think, you know, how is this all connected? Um, and so it comes about kind of full circle as we think about uh, where that carbon is um, being produced and stored and how that oxygen is being produced. So we are going to dig in to those things today. Um, so in a very simple um, term, Photosynthesis is the combination of oxygen, of carbon dioxide and water, and it those things are used by the plant, and they create a chemical equation 
um, and there are some really intricate uh, and unique processes that happen along the way that we won't discuss all of the tiny details and I do recommend that you look them up if you would like to. But the end result, the byproducts of photosynthesis are going to be oxygen and a simple carbohydrate such as glucose. Um, and so putting that all together is really important. So we have carbon dioxide and water as our inputs and then we also are going to need a reaction. So we need the sunlight that is causing the catalyst that we need to excite everything, get everything moving. And then we are producing a simple carbohydrate such as glucose and oxygen as a byproduct of that. Um, so that is in a very small nutshell what photosynthesis is. But we're not going to leave it right there because this is the bistro and we're going to get into the nitty gritty of how it goes. All right, so in chemical terms, I'm going to read this so that I make sure I don't mess it up. Um, photosynthesis is a light energized oxidation reduction process. Oxidation is the removal of electrons from a molecule and reduction refers to the gain of electrons by uh, a molecule. So in plant photosynthesis, we're using energy from light to drive oxidation of water, which produces oxygen gas and hydrogen ions and electrons. All right, so <laughs> I know it might be a lot kind of drinking from the fire hose today, but we're gonna get through it together. Um, and so photosynthesis came about because we, you know, the earth has changed. Um, high amounts of carbon were present in the air millions of years ago. Plants were huge. We talked a little bit about this last time we had a session um, and how those really, really large plants um, now are represented by species that are very small, such as our horsetails that are common now. Um, they used to be towering plants um, because of all the available carbon. And so those plants were photosynthetic uh, and they were able to create their own resources without having to be mobile and move around. They could actually absorb that energy from the light and turn it into carbohydrates and sugars that they could then use for their other processes and for their cell and protein development. Um, and so as the just things have changed within the atmosphere, with the environment, some things have been less or more available. And so plants have had to adapt over time and become much more specialized in how they are able to uh, gain energy. And so we're really thinking about the evolution of like blue green algae and how that has evolved into the plants that we see around us today, these beautiful angiosperms and gymnosperms that are highly specialized. So that took a long, long time. Um, but a lot of the photosynthetic processes that these plants are using are very common. So we have that um, convergent evolution happening, lots of different uh, pathways that we can use to have this same result. We're going to talk a little bit about different types of photosynthesis, um, but right now we're talking about something called C3, which is the most common form of photosynthesis. Uh, we will talk about two other methods of photosynthesis that are less common, um, but let's really focus on the majority of how plants photosynthesize. So. Um, we're talking about three billion years ago, give or take a few, um, bacteria resembling modern cyanobacteria um, were gradually releasing oxygen into our Earth's oxygen poor atmosphere. So like I said, there was a lot more carbon in the atmosphere at that time. Um, and so the increase in the oxygen concentration of our atmosphere is due to these early photosynthetic plants, these early photosynthetic life forms. And uh, we would not be here today without it because we need a high oxygen environment for our species to thrive. And so we should always say thank you to the plants in our lives that are producing that oxygen that we need uh, to thrive. And so we are um, benefiting from these byproducts that photosynthesis, photosynthesis produces. Um, and where does this happen? So the majority of photosynthesis is going to take place in the leaves. Um, and that's why they're always reaching for the sun. They want to be able to access as much light energy as possible. Um, there are certain types of light that are better for plants. We'll talk about that um, in a little bit too. But we're talking about the leaves. And so if we think back to our um, talk about cell structures, let me just do a quick review. 
inside the leaf you have several different types of tissues um, but the mesophyll layer is where we're going to be having most of the photosynthetic activity and so um, we have on the leaf um, small pores which are usually on the bottom of the leaf those are called stomata and they are found um, to be the places where gas exchange happens. So you can get um, carbon dioxide entering a leaf and then oxygen um, exiting the leaf. So that's really important that we have small little pores on the bottoms of our leaves that can be used for gas exchange. Um, we also have chloroplasts that are really important. And within the chloroplast is where photosynthesis takes place. Um, these chloroplasts tend to be green, which give us that beautiful, uh, vibrant green color that we associate with healthy plants. Um, and so that's the wavelength of light that is not being absorbed because it's being reflected back at us. And so, um, I always thought, you know, oh, green, like plants must love green light. You know, they love being green. Um, uh, when in actuality, they're using a lot of red and blue wavelength light and they reflect back a lot of that green in their chloroplasts. It is fall, so we'll be seeing less green leaves and some of the leaves around here will be vibrantly colored red or yellow. Um, and that is because the chloroplasts are kind of dying back as we get less um, direct light uh, and moving into the winter season. So um, we're talking about where photosynthesis is happening. Um, these chlorophyll molecules that take in energy from sunlight are kind of stacked up um, in these areas called thylakoid membranes. Um, and so light reactions take place in the thylakoid membranes and produce ATP and NADPH, uh, which goes into the stroma. Um, this is the space inside the chloroplast, but outside the thylakoid membranes. Um, and so they're stacked up in these little kind of, if you think about the way Mentos looks in a little sheath, um, look like little stacked Mentos. And we call those granum. Uh, that's how they are uh, arranged within the cell. And then around these stacks, there are stroma areas where the rest of the reactions take place. So we're going to split photosynthesis into two different sections. So we have light dependent reactions and we have a light independent reaction, which we also call the Calvin cycle. So this was um, named after the scientists that discovered that cycle. Um, and so the light dependent reaction, like you might already be thinking, <laughs> requires light. And so the light independent reaction does not require light, but it does require the products that are produced during the light dependent reaction. And so when a photon of light from the sun bounces into a leaf, its energy excites a chlorophyll molecule. And then that starts a process that splits a molecule of water. So remember, we're, we're using water in this process as well. The oxygen atom splitting off of the water bonds with another, which creates a molecule of oxygen, O2. The chemical reaction also produces a molecule called ATP, which is kind of a carrier that is used uh, in later processes, and NADPH, which allow the cell to store energy. Um, and they will take part in the synthesis part of photosynthesis. So we're literally using light to combine things together. After we have this light reaction, then we use those products in the Calvin cycle. And so uh, it's also sometimes called the dark reaction or the light independent reaction because it does not require light, um, but we need those light products to work. All right, so we've got that. So the steps in the Calvin cycle are carbon fixation, reduction, and regeneration. Um, carbon atoms are from, from carbon dioxide are fixed um, and are used to build three carbon sugars. This process is fueled by ATP and the NADPH from the light reactions. Uh, and at the end of photosynthesis, after we have had our light dependent and our light independent reactions happen, we have these products of oxygen and uh, simple carbon dioxide. Um, so the simple carbon dioxide, such as glucose, um, is usually incorporated into other processes and other um, 
things such as cellulose. They can do uh, make other types of sugars such as sucrose. So it, it gets into a little bit of a, a large idea of lots of variations on how plants are using these products. And honestly, we're finding out more all the time about what is produced during photosynthesis. It is kind of a very simplification to say like, okay, great, it's just producing oxygen and this carbohydrate. Um, but now we know that there's lots of things being produced during photosynthesis. Um, and the more we are able to look closely at these processes and study them, the more we find out. So if you're interested in this, there's definitely space in the scientific world for you to do this, some research. Um, so those carbohydrate glucose molecules go on to um, do things like make the cell walls of plants and um, provide all of the extra energy that it needs to do all of its growing. Um, and so let's think about this process just very simply. We've got our C3 photosynthetic pathway and it is, uh, uh, let's just say you're a beautiful little passion flower vine and you're growing in the sun, you've got plenty of sunshine, you have that nice morning sun that's not too harsh, um, you've got really fertile soil that has opportunities for roots to dig down deep, you have uh, access to fresh rainwater, you know, you're just, you're living life, you're doing great. Um, and so all of your photosynthetic processes are happening um, very efficiently. So you're not um, seeking anything to make that process more efficient. And so that works out really well for you. Good job, passion flower. Uh, produce lots of fruit for us, please, um, and beautiful flowers for all of our pollinator friends. There are some plants, though, that are growing in conditions where uh, that is not always going to be the case. And so over time, plants have evolved different adaptations to be able to tackle their required processes in a different way. Um, and so that's where we come into C4 and CAM, uh, which are the other two common types of photosynthetic processes. So these two other avenues evolved in, relate, in response to photorespiration. And photorespiration happens when it's very um, maybe hot, dry, the plant is not getting enough water. And so the plant will close the stomata, those little openings typically on the undersides of their leaves, um, to reduce water loss. Well, that also comes at a price. So you're reducing your water loss, but now you're not able to exchange the gases the way you used to. And so you're maybe having a higher concentration of um, you know, oxygen that's staying in the cell and is not being released. Um, you're maybe not able to get more carbon dioxide um, into your cells to start these processes. So um, plants that grow in these challenging conditions use two different methods to kind of work around this. And they don't come just for free, you know, they come at a price. C3 is kind of the, uh, you know, path of least resistance, um, least trade-offs, um, and so most plants have that pathway. But if you are growing in an area where you don't want to keep your stomata open uh, in all that time, or you don't want to have um, photorespiration stealing that wonderful um, photosynthetic products that you're making and making yourself inefficient, you might use something else. So C4 plants, the light dependent reaction and the Calvin cycle are physically separated. So in the C3 pathway, they're both happening within um, that mesophyll cell. And so um, we're finding that those are gonna be inside those chloroplasts where we have um, you know, the stroma and the thylakoids. And so that's all happening together. In C4, they separate that. So the light dependent reactions still need to be happening where the sun is shining most, which is gonna be in your leaves and your mesophyll, shells, mesophyll cells. Um, but the Calvin cycle is separated and the Calvin cycle then occurs in special cells around leaf veins and they're called bundle sheath cells. Um, and mesophyll cells are constantly pumping CO2 into the neighboring cells in the form of malate. Um, so there's a higher concentration of CO2 relative to oxygen 
um, right around this enzyme called Rubisco, which is the most common enzyme that we see in nature. Um, and it's a really important part of the photosynthetic process. Um, and so we don't want to be wasting our oxygen that's in the leaf because that's a product that we're okay we don't need that right now for photosynthesis uh rubisco is not um very discriminatory <laughs> it'll grab oxygen if it's available it'll grab carbon dioxide um and that's what we want it to be grabbing is the co2 um so that that light independent reaction can happen later and properly and that light dependent reaction can happen efficiently um, and so separating these two uh, processes in different parts of the cells are one way that plants deal with this. So an example of C4 plants are like crab grasses, sugarcane, and corn. Um, they're more common in habitats that are hot uh, and less abundant in, in areas that are cooler. Um, and so the benefits of this reduced photorespiration exceed the ATP cost of moving carbon dioxide uh, from the mesophyll cell to the bundle sheath cell. Now the other option is to have this CAM method, which stands for Crassulacean Acid Metabolism. So we'll just call it CAM, C-A-M. Um, and these plants minimize photorespiration and save water by actually separating the time that they do these different reactions. So you have your photosynthesis happening, you have your light dependent reactions and your Calvin cycle or light independent reactions. And instead of having them physically separated, they're temporally separated. So you need your light, your light dependent reactions to be happening in the daytime, um, but you don't necessarily want to have your stomata open during the daytime. Say if you are a cactus plant, um, you're gonna be losing a lot of water. And so if you can have your stomata open at night so that you can uh, not lose so much water and you know, it's a little bit more humid, um, you know, it's darker. So you can have your Calvin cycle happening at nighttime you can have your stomata open. Um, and so these plants are adapted to dry environments. Cacti, like I mentioned, are as an example, pineapples. Um, and the name was from the family of plants, the Crassulaceae, um, and the scientist that first discovered this pathway was in that family. Um, and so they're also very water efficient, tend to be very water efficient, so that they're really thinking about ways that they can be adapted to their environment. Um, and so the um, dominant areas that they are in are like deserts. Like I said, though, these are not, uh, C4 and CAM are not common pathways of photosynthesis. C3 is like over, I was seeing some different numbers, but at least 85 to like over 90% of the plants that we see on a regular basis are going to be using the C3 pathway, which means that these light dependent and light independent reactions are happening in the same space and typically simultaneously because um, they just kind of keep going and going and going and going. Um, so let's move a little bit. Let's shift just a little bit. Let's shift over to light. Let's just think about this light. Um, and this is where we're going to have some practical applications for this knowledge for you. So when a light hits the leaves, um, it shines on the chloroplasts, typically these green, green leaves, um, and their thylakoid membranes. Um, and so the pigment of the chlorophyll, which is green, um, absorbs light energy. And so remember, it's not absorbing green light to make it green. It's actually reflecting back that wavelength of light that we can see with our eyes. And it's absorbing red and blue wavelengths of light. Um, light travels in waves and the distance between the waves determines the energy level. So like purples and blues have a higher energy level than like your reds and your oranges and your yellows. Um, and so it's interesting to think about how these different wavelengths of light will affect plants um, and what we can do as um, houseplant mommies and daddies um, and gardeners and farmers to make sure that our plants have what they need to be successful. So light energy initiates the process of photosynthesis as these pigments absorb the light. Um, the organic pigments um, are, have a range of energy that they can absorb. 
And so this was interesting to me um, that energy levels lower than those represented by red light are insufficient to raise an orbital electron um, to an excited or quantum state. And energy levels higher than those in blue light can physically tear molecules apart. <laughs> so it's also called bleaching. Um, so I have a lot of uh, plants that I have seen that have gotten, you know, a little burned, right? It's like, oh, like that light concentration um, can sometimes be too much. And so we really need to find that sweet balance for our plants. Um, and so the chlorophyll absorbs lights that we see as blue and red. Um, but at the same time, that's an oversimplification. So I think that I have seen some um, lights that are you know, being marketed in a way that's like, oh, this is the exact wavelength your plants need. Um, well, there are different other pigments in plants as well. And so we're just starting to figure out what the full range of plants might need. Um, but I do want to bring up an example. There's an organization called 80 Acres that is growing uh, plants under lights. They're growing plants in a warehouse hydroponically, so they don't use soil. So it's an artificial growth chamber, essentially. Um, I don't, it's not actually 80 acres like under lights, but I mean, they're growing lots and lots of wonderful food, local food um, that is not dependent on, you know, the rain and the, um, you know, lack of clouds to, to make it work. So they're kind of doing some cutting edge technology. And when you see pictures of this uh, setup, it's purple, the light is purple. And so I'm like, what is going on with that? Um, and really what they say on their website is that uh, their growers create distinct recipes for different plants um, so that they're able to really get the exact wavelengths of light that they need for certain types of processes. So um, there are certain wavelengths that will induce flowering. There are certain wavelengths that will promote vegetative growth. Um, there are ways that Horticulturists have figured out the amount of light that is needed for poinsettias, for example, to start to color their bracts. So those um, red leaves, essentially, that are, we call those bracts, and they will um, not start to do that color change unless they have a 12-12 light cycle. You can induce that with other types and colors and wavelengths of light. Uh, so really getting into kind of the science behind wavelengths and how light is used within the plant. It's all dependent on how this photosynthesis is happening. Now, something that I wondered while I was doing this research was what about like red lettuce, like red leafed lettuce? Um, you know, other plants, these purple plum leaves, like, okay, so are they still, they must still be photosynthesizing, um, but they're not using all the same wavelengths that we see in our other green plants. Um, and so how does that work? And so what people now recommend, uh, if you're growing a range of plants or you're just kind of starting out, especially with indoor growing, is to use a full spectrum bulb because there are lots of wavelengths that we can't even see with our own eyes. We're fairly limited in how much visible light we're able to absorb in our own eyes. And um, using a full spectrum bulb is really a great way to make sure that your plants are getting what they need but I have seen plants that have beautiful variegation on the leaves, stripes, different colors. If they're not grown in full sun um, or with a full spectrum light, they can revert to different colors. They can start to just be kind of a darker, sometimes even a pale green. And so you can tell it's, oh, I, you know, they're not doing so great. They're not at their peak performance. And so they are trying to be able to get more uh, photosynthesis happening to support themselves and so they're reverting back to kind of the the easy street right it's like okay I'm, this this purple thing it's not working out as well these pigments I really need some uh, more of that green pigment so it's it's an interesting kind of balance but if you are interested in using indoor lighting or um, growing plants at home if you're growing more than one variety of plant I would highly recommend the broad spectrum bulbs if you are just doing one or two species, you can do some research on those. There's actually some pretty uh, extensive research that people are doing on the types of lights that should be used, the amount of time that they should be under lights, uh, and how you can you know, maybe do a quick flash of blue here to kickstart something or a quick flash of red uh, to get uh, the reproductive cycle going. 
Um, the other things we want to think about and apply this information to is making sure that our plants have what they need. So like I said, that very simple equation um, that we use for photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus water with sunlight input produces a sugar and oxygen. Um, and so if you are growing plants inside, um, you need to make sure they have good airflow. So in part two, we're gonna talk about transpiration and respiration. Um, and plants actually also use oxygen at certain parts of their physiolo physiological processes. So um, you need carbon dioxide and oxygen to be flowing around these plants. And so that's why it's important to make sure there's good ventilation in your grow rooms. Um, because like that little candle that Priestley was using, that candle can use all of the um, combustible, um, what was he calling them, elements, uh, units in the air. Um, and then you're, you don't have the whole range of products that you need to be successful. So we wanna make sure that we're well ventilated, we have full light spectrum, and then we definitely need water to make this happen. So um, plants that go very dry for a very long time are not able to effectively photosynthesize. If they are unable to do that, then they can't produce their own food. They're no longer photoautotrophs. Um, and so they're gonna be really, really struggling to photosynthesize and be able to produce new carbohydrates that they can then turn into their proteins and uh, use for their cell structures. So we wanna think about those things um, and how we are just maintaining our garden spaces. Um, if there are you know, bugs that are living on our house plants or those little spider mites that create those kind of nets of um, webs, you know, that's going to interfere with the sunlight that's coming in. You know, maybe on the undersides of your leaves, if you need to turn those over and you see that there's powdery mildew or uh, other things that may even just dust, so that dirt that's get kicked up from the ground after heavy rain, that means that the stomata might not be able to open and provide good gas exchange. Um, so it's more about paying really close attention to all of these different adaptations that plants have made over time in order to be effective photosynthesizers and make sure that we're helping them complete those processes the best we can. Whew, well, that, was, that, was a big, that was a big science one, you guys. Um, I am really excited to hear from you, so I'm going to turn on the chat in just a moment. Uh, just a reminder that part two of plant physiology is going to be October 20th. Um, and extra points if you find a little person in your life that uh, is missing their two front teeth and try to get them to say photosynthesis. 